Hey guys, I apologize for my appearance more than normal today. I'm uh, I'm feeling a little under the weather right now, and it's cold in the garage, so I'm not trying to be a hero and look good when I'm feeling a little sick. Um, today we're going to talk about technological innovations in the late 19th century. Specifically, we're going to start out with one material that's going to be absolutely critical for all of this, and that material is steel. And it's a material that really made our part of the world what it is today. So let's get started. The importance of steel really starts in a lot of ways with farms. Um, the steel moldboard plow, which I have a picture of here and I'll talk about in just a minute, um, makes breaking up tough soil possible, especially the kind of tough soil you're going to find on the Great Plains. So if you remember when we talked about the West, we talked about the vast grasslands that cover the middle of this country and how the grass has really dense, intricate uh, root networks, and it's really hard to break through those roots. Before the plow that you see here, which I know looks like it may as well be 700 years old to you guys, before this plow, a lot of plows were made of wood. And if you try to pull a wood plow through a bunch of dense roots, you're going to get precisely nowhere. If you drag an iron plow through, an iron plow is going to work a little bit, but iron gets brittle in the cold, it's really heavy. Those didn't work really well either. It's when the plow starts being made of steel that it's different. And we'll talk about the nature of steel in just a little bit. Um, this steel moldboard plow, it did a couple of things. Number one, so it was pulled by a horse, right? You guys can kind of see that it's going to hook onto a, a couple of horses or a horse right here. All right. Then it's got handles where the farmer follows behind with it. All right. And then the steel part is called the mold board. And I hope you'll notice that it curves, right? It kind of curves like the plow on the front of a snow plow. And you guys know what happens when a snow plow goes through snow. Um, the snow kind of shoots off to the sides. It gets overturned. And the same thing is happening here with the steel mold board plow. It is um, turning over the dirt, and it's turning up the big uh, clods of dirt. It's turning up the roots. It's bringing the most fertile parts of the soil to the top, and the soil that's kind of overgrown gets sent down to the bottom, where that material then gets to decompose and make the, the soil fertile again. It's a really big deal. Plows before this basically just made you a line in the dirt. This turns the dirt over. Now, you're wondering, maybe you're wondering, why haven't we talked about who invented this? Because you're going to laugh. Because it's the green hat that everybody in the country wears. It's John Deere. There was an actual guy named John Deere, and John Deere invents the steel moldboard plow, which is frankly one of the, the most important inventions uh, of the middle to late part of the 1800s. Another invention comes along called the McCormick Reaper. And uh, I had the opportunity earlier this year to go out and make a little video about the McCormick Reaper. So here's the McCormick Reaper. Okay, hopefully that was at least somewhat interesting to you with the big beater bars that go around, um, lots of parts, lots of parts made of steel. Hope you're noticing a little theme here. Another big thing was steam threshers. So a steam thresher, I, I wish I thought to show you a picture of one here. Um, a steam thresher is basically a giant steam engine on wheels. So if you can imagine a big metal tube with a smokestack coming out of it, it was a big steam engine on wheels that could power other things. It had a belt that came off the side, and that belt was what they sometimes called a power takeoff. And the importance of the steam engine wasn't that it could propel itself through a field, which it could sometimes. You could, your steam engine would have a power takeoff to back wheels that would allow it to drive out the field. It wasn't that it was a self-propelled vehicle that made it important. It was the fact that it could make other machinery go. It was one engine that could power many different machines. Now, you think, okay, that's crazy. That's not what we do anymore. I'm going to tell you you're wrong. This is what tractors do. A lot of you who grow up in the city think that a tractor is just a big thing that they use to drag stuff around or they put a plow on the front or whatever. Tractors, the magic of a tractor is not the fact that it moves. And I have another video from the same place as the last one to show you the magic of tractors with power takeoff. Okay, 
So hopefully you learned something. Uh, I grew up in the country, so this is the kind of stuff that I always kind of took for granted. And it wasn't, in, it wasn't until I started teaching that I realized, oh, not everybody knows this stuff. Okay, what did all these farm tools have in common? Every last one of them has major components made of steel. The moldboard of the plow, the uh, bars and blades on the reaper, virtually everything on the steam engine, uh, the steam thresher, almost every one of these things um, has major parts made of steel. So what's gonna happen? Well, it's kind of hard to say what comes first, the egg, the chicken or the egg, um, but these farm implements that are absolutely necessary for farming these giant areas out on the Great Plains, um, they're gonna require more steel. And one of the reasons they're gonna get made is because steel is more common, but they're also gonna drive the demand for steel. Steel is the driving factor of the late 19th century period. Steel is so critically important. And I will make the argument time and again, you cannot understand America unless you understand steel. So let's talk a little bit about what steel is. Steel is created from iron. So you need the element of iron ore, okay? Which is dirty and it comes from under the ground and, and it's kind of like a uh, tannish red stuff. And you take that iron and you melt it. Now, it's not just enough to melt the iron and then pour it into something, that's called iron casting. In this case, what you have to do is purify it. So iron, it naturally occurs in the earth. Okay, it's element Fe. Um, iron occurs in the earth, but it's not like it's completely pure. You have to like get the impurities off of it because there's other things, a lot of carbon that's on it, and and other you know different materials that can be in with iron ore. And to make steel, you have to purify it. So how do you get the how do you get it purified? Well, typically what they did was superheat this stuff to the point where lots of the things that are not iron just burn off, okay? It's so hot that they become vapor. They, they combust and burn off. Other stuff, you blow hot air through this big um, cavity that the iron is in, this cauldron that the iron is in, and you blow the air through to get other perfections, imperfections to bubble to the surface. It skims, it burns off, and you end up with pure iron. Then you add in other things, and I am not a metallurgist, so I don't know a lot about these other things, but I know sometimes it's tin or this or that, um, I'm sorry, zinc or other things that get put in with the iron ore <coughs> in what's called the Bessemer process to make steel out of iron. What does it make? It creates a lighter, harder, more resilient metal than iron, something that won't crack in the cold, um, something that is lighter than iron and can be pulled by one horse, something that is more resilient and won't just break when it hits something or chip off when it breaks something. And your three elements you need to make steel, iron ore, coal to superheat it, and then water to cool it later. Those are the things you have to have to make steel. So where in the world do you have those three elements? Right here, right where we are. Our part of the world, the Upper Great Lakes, Ohio, Southern Michigan, Western Pennsylvania. Um, your ideal locations were in the Lower Great Lakes because we have a lot of iron ore in the Upper Great Lakes. Up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, over into Minnesota, there's lots and lots of iron ore. So you put that on ships. You send it down the Great Lakes, through Lake Superior, down through Lake Huron, down to Lake Erie. And the lakes provide the water that you need, right? But the other thing you need is the coal. And most of the coal is down towards Appalachia. So Appalachian, Ohio had coal mining, Appalachian, Kentucky, Appalachian, Pennsylvania, all had lots of coal mining and, and still do have active coal mining to this day. Um, so your ideal location for this is gonna be someplace kind of in the middle, someplace that has access to the coal has access to the iron ore and has a lot of fresh water. And that's going to be the lower Great Lakes. Places like Cleveland. Cleveland is going to have a huge steel industry. Detroit is going to have a big steel industry. Youngstown is going to have a major steel industry. Pittsburgh, obviously, they're called the Steelers, you guys. That's not an accident. 
um, Pittsburgh is a center of steel production. So the steel industry is really going to be centered around us. And it's why the car industry is going to be here. And other industries that use lots of steel are all going to be in our part of the world. It starts here. I think you could really say Toledo starts here. And um, if I'm in indulging myself for a moment, I'll say that America starts here with steel. Now, as prices come down, as they get better and better at making steel, the price comes down and steel starts getting used in other applications. One of them is ships. If you guys remember during the Civil War, we talked about when they put iron on the hulls of ships. Well, what are some of the problems of iron? Uh, it rusts really easily, it's super duper heavy, and it's brittle. This doesn't sound like crap that I want on a ship for very long if steel is an option. Steel is lighter, steel doesn't rust as easily if it's properly maintained, um, and steel is not as brittle. So we start getting steel built ships, um, like this one that you see here. Uh, hull made entirely of steel, riveted and welded together. We start getting rails, uh, rails made of real steel instead of iron, rails that can really uh, stand up under any condition, can carry any load, and they're lighter and easier to get put into place. It's going to make railroad building so much easier. Skyscrapers. For the first time ever, you're going to be able to make buildings that are more than eight stories tall um, because a brick frame could, old brick and wood could only support so much building. Now you're going to be able to make buildings with steel with just these spindly little, you guys have seen buildings under construction, spindly little girders and, and, uh, and risers and beams that, that allow you to make a huge building. So skyscrapers are going to change the way we live, change the places we work. Barbed wire. Now, this is something you're like, so what? Who cares? Barbed wire, whatever, okay? So they were able to keep people in jail. Who cares about that? Here's the really big deal. Out in the West, which we talked about earlier in this unit, in the West, they had what was called open range. That's why you needed cowboys. You guys remember like like the branding that they would put on the back of a cattle? So it's like Circle K, and they get a hot piece of metal that has a K with a circle around it, and heat it up, and they go, and they brand their cattle with it so they know whose cows are whose. The reason they had to do that is nobody could keep their cows where they wanted them. Because out on the Great Plains, what are you going to make a fence out of? There's no trees out there. It's all grassland. How are you going to make a fence? So this guy, Joseph Glidden, comes up with the idea of making a fence out of wire that has little pokey things on it. Why? Because cows are stupid. Okay? Cattle are stupid. And if, if you've never heard this before, make a rural friend and talk to your rural friends about how stupid cattle are. Like cattle and turkey, two dumbest animals on the farm. And possibly my dog. Um... Cattle are really, really dumb. And so a cow walks up, a 1,500 pound cow walks up to a 16 ounce fence that has something pokey on it, pokes her nose into it and goes, moo, that hurt, and she walks the other way. She doesn't have the brain power to think, hey, little temporary pain here, I could be through this fence and they're never gonna make steak out of me. Um, no, barbed wire holds them in. And this was Joseph Glidden's genius. He creates this steel wire that comes on a roll, and now you can take a huge ranch and fence it in. You can create fences. Now, what does that mean? How does it change the West? You don't need cowboys anymore. You got all your cows, your, all your cattle on your property with a fence. You don't need cowboys anymore. So cowboys, their whole era, the whole cowboy era, less than 20 years, okay? That it, which is kind of crazy to think about. But the whole cowboy culture existed for less than 20 years. That's, um, you know, like Beyonce's career basically right now. And they're useless. We don't need them anymore. Um, the, and I don't mean that about Queen Bee, by the way. She is completely useful and we still need her. But cowboys after 20 years, gone. Don't need them. Um, the barbed wire changes the, the nature of the West. The West had been based on public land that belongs to everybody that each of us can have rights to graze our animals on. And all of a sudden land becomes mine, 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 mine. This is mine. It's not yours. And uh, now you're going to start having conflicts about whose land is whose and who has the rights to certain land. And barbed wire, as you see, it changes over time into different kinds of barbed wire. We don't care. We just care about the idea of barbed wire. What did all this do? It revolutionized things. It revolutionized the way cities look. 
Cities look different because of skyscrapers. There's no getting around that. City of Toledo looks different because of steel. New York, Chicago, L.A. look completely different because of steel. Um, how we get from place to place. Trains, ships. How we get from place to place becomes easier and more reliable because of steel. How ranching works. No more open range. Changes because of steel. How crops are grown. Changes because of steel. It's easier to grow crops now. What does this do? Brings down the price of food. Food prices come way, way, way down for people. And they have kind of stayed down for our entire lives and your parents' entire lives and your grandparents' entire lives. Food prices are way lower than they were compared to income back in the 1870s because all of these inventions made it so much cheaper to get food from farm to your table. Um, the other big thing, and what we really care about where we live, it creates massive numbers of jobs in the cities, especially in the Great Lakes states, states that made steel. And you see the population of Toledo explode in the 1880s. Detroit explodes. Youngstown, Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, Cincinnati, all these cities around us, their populations explode during this manufacturing boom. In our next video, we're going to talk a little more about what that meant. What, what did these factories do? How were they organized? How did they make money? And how did that change America too? Guys, thanks for being with me. As always, be well.